believe, how does that affect our expectations and our behavior? Well, first of all, the lie goes straight to our heart and it creates that belief system that we have. That belief then becomes an expectation in our life. And that expectation that we have forms our behavior. The behavior becomes our um, experience and the experience leads right back to a belief system. So uh, t using my example uh, with my wounds, um, you know, because of uh, what was said to me, we'll do that. What be, uh, for me, you know, there, I was told that I wouldn't amount to anything. And so my belief was that I can't speak well. I can't perform a task very well. Uh, I have no value. Nothing I say is important. So the belief system really was that I can't do anything. Uh, then leading to a behavior, um, well, the belief became that expectation. So the expectation then was that I would behave in that manner as my belief system said. So I will behave in a manner to make sure that I meet that. You know, my expectation was that I really won't speak because I can't. Uh, it's not important to anything I say anyway. Well, then when that behavior becomes your experience, well, the experience really was because I was expecting not to speak well, I didn't speak well. I didn't do anything well because that was my expectation. And then how that goes back to your belief system is, you know, because I didn't speak well or do this well, that was my experience. That went right back around to my belief system again. So all, all this is to say your whole belief system forms your be expectation, your behavior, your experience. And, and, and so that's why we need to break that lie that God has. A little bit, this diagram I'm showing is a little bit easier to understand in my mind that, you know, uh, the lie forms the belief, it forms the expectation in our life. The expectation then is our behavior that we act out what we expect to happen and then that behavior becomes the experience and all goes in a cycle. So the whole part is to identify that we have a lie and then to attack that lie and get God's revelation. Okay, let's move on. We've, we've said hurts form the ungodly beliefs. The ungodly beliefs in our system then, our li the lies that we believe will will form how we behave in life or how we react to what people say or what they do. Uh, again, for me, like, the wound was I was told I wouldn't amount to anything. The lie was I believed I would not amount to anything no matter what I did. And the sin from that or my behavior became that I exaggerated, I lied in order to earn, to, to make people think I did matter. So, so I was told I wouldn't amount to anything. That's the lie I believed that I wouldn't. So I compensated with my behavior to exaggerate, to lie, to do everything I could to tell people that I did matter. Because, you know, I couldn't just be myself, you know, from my wounds. I had to be more than, and so I, I lied. I'll give you an example, at a sports banquet. I don't know, if it's, it's basically the end of the year, your sports is where you get the awards. For, for how good you were in sports. Uh, I was there, mom and dad were not there yet. They were getting out of the field and coming a little later. People asked me, where's your mom and dad? Sixth or seventh grader, I told them, mom had a nervous breakdown, she won't be here. Now, you know, that's pretty dumb. I know mom's gonna be there, but I had to lie and I had to exaggerate because I, I wanted the thrill of the moment to try to get attention on me, to try to be somebody. And you're going to see that a lot, that it doesn't matter what the consequences are later, which the consequences were not good for me when I got home. But for that moment, I exaggerated. So that, was, that all came out of the original wound of the verbal part to me. Okay, so what is sin? I like this definition in Romans 7, 15 through 20. And this is kind of paraphrasing, but it says, 
For that which I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. For the good that I wish, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am I don't like to say I, I, it's not that's this part isn't scriptural. It's just me saying it's kind of like you can't help but do it, but but it's from the wound that that came. Okay, so uh, moving on, the hurts caused the ungodly beliefs, caused the sin in our life. Then it very possibly could lead to being in darkness, and you're hiding that from other people. I will tell you, most of my stuff did not come out until just a few years ago. Donna didn't know about sexual abuse until 2006. And uh, so you, you, and keeping it in darkness, you're going to see, and you saw that that's the open door to the evil. Uh, keeping it in dark is very, very dark, very, very um, dangerous. Okay, so moving on, on the next diagram, uh, the darkness then leads to demonic oppression or an open door to the evil. Um, and notice the, the link to this when we've come around full circle and you've opened the door to the evil, you also have a link then back to another wound. Because once you've brought in Satan, he's going to continue with more wounding and more he will get to other people. So, so if you've let the cycle go to the hurts, a lie, you've sinned, you've kept it in dark, you've opened the door to the evil, it's going to be a vicious cycle. And, and this is a simple, you've got one arrow, We've got thousands of wounds, thousands of hundreds. I, I don't know if there's thousands. A lot of lies. Moving on, we've given the picture of the wounds, how they affect each other. Uh, let's get healed. So what's the road to healing? How do we obtain these, these healings? Uh, next slide, Bill. Well, nothing in your life is going to change until you do. And you have to really, really grasp that changing somebody else is not an option. It's not your purpose. It's not what you're to do. Somebody else could be 99.9% .9 wrong with something. And this is all about how do we react to that? How do we get healed so that we can fulfill what God has for us? So our whole focus is on us individually, n nobody else. And next... You are the only one that you can change. And again, you're responsible for your actions. Uh, you know, I could have stayed in, in um, a whole lot of unforgiveness, a whole lot of stuff with my brother, with what he did with my father, but that doesn't make me go to where God wants me to be. I would have just been the victim for my whole life. So the whole thing, keep in mind, is you're the one we're focusing on. You're the one that needs to change. Even if you're not wrong, and only if you're one-tenth of one percent wrong, you're responsible for that. Okay, the next one and the last one on this is the choices you make today determine your quality of life tomorrow. Um, and what I want to discuss here is, and Catherine kind of talked about some of this last night, you know, just because you're saved doesn't mean that you're in Romans and 1 John, it talks about restoring our hearts. Uh, and how about, you know, if we don't forgive our brother, um, you know, you forgive your brother so it may go well with you. I mean, all that says to me that we need healing and we need to, to look at. Um, May 21st, 1998, I was saved. 48 years old before I ever gave my life to Jesus. I had another part of it was, I had gone to church for 20-some years, sit in the pew, but hadn't given my life to Jesus. And so there could be a lot of people sitting there, not here, but in church that really don't know and don't have a relationship with Jesus. But anyway, I gave my life to Jesus, was on fire for him tremendously. I talked to everybody about God, and I did everything what I thought was for God. I served on every committee there was in the church. 
from the day I was saved. I, I was the lead usher, the lead communion steward. I was the finance committee chair. I was on the church council. If there was a committee, I was on it. I should never have been on any of those committees. I had been saved, but I had still been tremendously wounded, and I was doing everything for the attention of Tom, not for the glory to God. And, uh, you know, I, it still hurts me to say that, but, uh, but we have a lot of wounded people that have been saved, and, and uh, you, you need the wounds healed in order to be all that God has for you. I was into works big time because that was from my wounds. Okay, let's go back around and next diagram. Uh, we'll go backwards to the demonic oppression or to close the door to the evil is deliverance. And we'll talk about this more, but there really are, in my mind, two types of deliverance. One is supernatural or one where God just comes in and does things, or the other is where God uses us to help in, in the deliverance process. I'll give you the example for me is, is uh, of my wounds, God was so gracious and so loving that uh, I received a supernatural deliverance. May 21st, 2004, so six years after I'd been saved, went to a conference, it was far out there for me because I'd never been into the heavens and, and really known anything like this. But the speaker saw down in front of the platform the furnace and said, wow, I said, this is the second time in my life, but I think he wants you, all of you cleansed. And there was 150, 200 of us or so. There was quite a few in the conference. So everybody comes through and, and went around this way, and they came through the furnace. And, and he said, make sure that you're repented and you are ready for this, or you're going to feel the heat of the furnace when you get here. It was, you know, I, I thought it was wild, and I didn't believe any of it. But I, I was close to the end of the line. But as I was moving in the line, something came over me, and I repented for all my sins. And, and, and we'll get later that in my mind is a true repentance because I hurt for what I had been doing to people and saying to people in, in my whole life. Well, I got to the furnace. I mean, it was the furnace looked like this. There was nothing there in, in the physical realm, but there was in the spiritual and I went through, and I don't remember anything happening until I got all the way through. Nobody thought anything was going to happen to me, and I went out, first time baptized in the Spirit, and hit, like, steps to the sh church, and everybody said I shook the church out for 45 minutes, and the, this is what they've told me. And the experience I had was I literally saw the crud in my life, all the dirt just floating toward heaven. And so God was so gracious to give me a supernatural deliverance. Um, moving on to, I want to talk more about deliverance with, with, with healing. Now, here's the, here's the steps as I see them for deliverance. In Matthew 10, 1, in having summoned his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. So, you know, I mean, that says we have the authority, and, and we literally have the authority to cast out. And, and why don't we all do that? I mean, you know, so, so if we cast them out, we just need to remember. I mean, I guess we've now seen, Don and Sheila and Bill and I have seen a lot of deliverances, and there are multiple types. It can just be very gentle. It can be where there's a lot of manifestation. And when we went to Africa last year with all the witchcraft, there was a lot of manifestation going on. But, but the point is, every single one of us, we, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. He gave us the authority. Just say, be gone in the name of Jesus. But make sure that you fill them back up with the Holy Spirit so he doesn't go and bring all his friends back and make it worse for the person. So cast them out, fill them up with the Holy Spirit. It really is as simple as that. Um, and in Luke 4.18, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed. Again, we have the authority. The Holy Spirit's in us. Don't be afraid of deliverance. A big magical word. Uh, and deliverance has a lot of different meanings. But to me, supernatural, God does it, or we just 
if, if we discern there's something demonic, something that are just cast it out, fill it up with the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's move on to, and we're, and we're going to get more in depth in a lot of these. Uh, darkness is just bring the light to it. Uh, and you will see from this diagram that uh, once we've brought it to light, we have eliminated the open door to evil. That demonic oppression is no longer there for that individual wound. Uh, so you have just healed somebody or healed yourself when you bring it to light because you have closed a door. But there's still a wound. There's still healing to be done. But you've, you've closed the door that he can't harass you anymore. Okay, so choose light over darkness. Um, you know, when you walk into a dark room, uh, you don't cast out the light or the dark. You don't cast out the dark. I mean, you turn on the light. So you don't cast out a darkness. You just turn on the light um, because light dispels the darkness. And, and I like what somebody said, and I, I don't remember who it was, but what they said was, uh, when you do that, when you, when you turn on the light to something, it releases a river of God's love to produce healing. Actually, it's from somebody from Jack Frost area. I just don't know who it was. So, so I like that, that it releases a river of God's love to dispel that, to, to produce a healing. So what's our steps to get out of darkness? Well, first of all, you need to confess to an accountability partner. Uh, and I think everybody is aware of this common sense. Just make sure you choose that accountability partner wisely. Uh, telling somebody something, the wrong person, could produce a greater wound than what you had to start with. Somebody you trust, somebody that really keeps it confidential, possibly to start with, depending on what the wound is. But just make sure you check with God, who should I really be giving this to? Um, I had a recent revelation, I'd say about a year or so ago, that, um, well, let's go to, you want to focus on the direction that you're going, not on the issue. Um, I had a revelation, it's not scriptural, but it's a revelation to me, that, you know, when we pray for things and we have issues or we have something there that we typically, we think about that problem and we just start praying for it. And God can heal, he can do anything there is, and he, uh, he very well could. The revelation that was given to me was, said, you know, said, the issue itself really is in Satan's realm, and so if we're thinking about that problem we have, we're really kind of over in Satan's realm to start with, so what we really should do for better results for prayer, and this is not scriptural, this is just something that came to me, it is really, it was, you know, he does say, praise him, worship him, get into thanksgiving. And what, what it was revealed to me is, just start praising God. You know, don't even think about this problem. Praise him, worship him, give him thanks. And you've, got, you've just positioned yourself over into God's realm. Then ask for the prayer. Then go with the problem. And the percentages of prayer answers are increased. It's not scriptural. You don't have to receive that, but... That was a revelation to me, and I, and I believe that because I think when we're in corporate situations, for instance, it just seems like there's more healings or, or things happen. So, so I just suggest to you, if, if it resonates, maybe we ought to thank God first and, and really get over there with him before we really get into Satan's realm. Uh, remember also, uh, God's blood does not cleanse what you choose to keep in darkness. I think that's a pretty profound statement that, uh, you know, if you keep it in darkness and, and you have the free will, then there's really, his blood's not going to cover. So bring it to light. Okay, moving on. Uh, the, how do we heal the sin, our behaviors? And everybody knows this, but it's really repent, forgive, take it to the cross. And as you notice, if you do those things, you have just, that has brought it to light. You no longer have that open door to evil. You no longer have being in darkness. And you're also getting rid of the sin and the behavior. Now, 
that's why, it, and we'll have a whole topic next on forgiveness, but uh, when you forgive, tremendous healing. I mean, tremendous, and I'll give you my testimony later on that, but, uh, but as you look at this diagram, because you forgive and repent, you receive healing, but you also still have a lie that you believe. You also still have that wound that you haven't dealt with. So while you may feel healed, and you are healed to a degree, just remember, you know, if I don't go back and really deal with the wound with the root cause, all of this could come back again. So how, what's the requirements for healing sin? Well, first, repent and confess the sin. And in Proverbs 28, 13, it says, He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, and again, my part of the repentance testimony is I already gave you that this, in my heart, I had never felt that way before that when I repented for my sins, and I named some of them, but mostly it was in general. That's when God blessed me with being baptized and supernaturally took away a lot of the, the pain that I had had as a child. So that's the importance of repentance. Uh, forgiveness. Um, I'm not going to go into that, uh, but you do need to forgive yourself and others that hurt you because, again, Sheila's going to talk on that next, and we'll have prayer for that. The last thing is lay the wound the person, the anger, the pain at the foot of the cross. In Colossians it says, And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions and having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So, so really... For any sin, you identify it, you need to repent, you need to forgive. It's a requirement to forgive. She was going to go in depth on that. And, and really, you just need to lay it to the cross. Okay, so the next diagram, let's move on to the lies, how, how we get rid of those. Um, it's only God's revelation. It's only God's revelation. It's, it would have been very simple for anybody to tell me I had value, you're getting great grades, you're a great, great athlete, you're anything there is, you can do anything you want, it wouldn't have been revealed. Uh, I mean, it wasn't God's revelation, and I, I, my spirit did not accept that. And we're going to talk about how, how to get that revelation. Um, well, first of all, you need to do the previous part and forgive anybody, but Again, she was going in that, but, but to receive God's revelation, one of the big parts is forgiveness. So here's the steps to healing ungodly beliefs or our lies. First of all, you recognize it. You ask God for it. or I mean, if it doesn't line up with what God says, doesn't line up with Scripture, then it's a lie. So the first step is just to recognize, you know, I mean, truly, and it's a choice. Like for me to say, I have no value, and I was really getting accolade after accolade and award after award, and I mean, if I had common sense, that's a lie. So you have to make a choice to, to search for, um, you know, in Psalm 139, it says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, allow the Holy Spirit to do that. You know, if I had known God back then, maybe I would have known to, to ask God for the answer. I didn't. I was on my own. I felt I was on my own. Um, basically, if you're, quote, triggered by anything, somebody says something, you get angry, you get, you know, you're whatever, there probably is a lie that you're believing because Jesus probably didn't get triggered. Well, he did overturn the tables, but... But, uh, yeah, that's right, right, just anger. So, 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 I mean, one of the tests really is if, if you get triggered, you know, what's the lie? And ask God, 
What's the lie there? Because you, 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 you have to get rid of the lies in order to receive revelation. Uh, second thing, then once you've identified that lie, repent for that lie. In James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. So you need to repent and then renounce it. Uh, we need to use our authority as forgiven children of God you know, to break any agreement with that line. The last thing is receive a new godly belief. Uh, you know, re renew your mind by, you know, receive that belief, God's truth, but, it, but it's been proven like it takes 30 days to break a lie. Repeat that truth to yourself every day, every day. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example now of, of, of mine, the, the airplane spin that I talked about where my brother was taking me around. Uh, through forgiveness, I started receiving more revelation as I forgave my brother. One of those was that, that God spoke to me and said, all he, all he said was, Tom, with, with revolving not being able to see anything going round and round or do any, you know, watch anything, look, look um, at the fun you're missing out with your grandchildren. We have seven grandchildren. I mean, that's all I heard from God. Now, how simple is that? But it was a revelation to me that came straight from God's heart. I was so excited. We went to Disney World a few months later. Rode, I rode the teacups. You know, they go round and round inside, around and round, and laughed and laughed. It, the, the circling does not bother me, and all it was was a revelation from God and not a human. So, so we, we really need to get through the, the healing process, the forgiveness and, and that, in order to start receiving more revelation. Um, in the well, you know, where my brother put me in the well, afraid of water, afraid of everything, afraid of darkness, a lot of claustrophobia, um, nightmares, things. After I started going through the healing process and layer after layer, somebody said to me one night, Tom, you're a Joseph. Well, Joseph was in the well. I mean, it was just like a light bulb went off. I'm a Joseph. I mean, mighty, mighty. And uh, I mean, it just changed my whole view of water. So, 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 but that didn't, those revelations didn't start coming until I started doing my part and, and went through looking at all the different healing processes I needed. Uh, there's more examples, but I'm going to, I've, received lots of revelation. It's only... That's right. Um, when we were here in October of 2010, this was after I had been healed of water fears and everything else and can't swim. We went with Pastor Catherine and Tom and we went to the Great Barrier Reef and I scuba dived and I snorkeled and I'm afraid of water. <laughs> but it was great. Yeah, I'm not. I was being facetious. I, but anyway. But, you know, God's revelation just changes our life. And, and so that's a goal that, you know, what is the lie I'm believing? If I have a symptom that doesn't line up with what God's saying and what his truth about us in Scripture, then there's a lie, and that's where we're, we're headed toward. Okay. The last step is, um, and you notice from all these, as you... Like, for instance, when, when I forgave, it broke the link to no longer to have an open door to the evil or it was in darkness. When I got, received God's revelation for that, for that lie I believed, I would no longer, in essence, sin or my, my whole behavior changed. Well, now for the original wound, which we really want to get to, it's only God's love and, a, and an encounter with his love that displaces that wound. Uh, you know, counselors are great. God puts them in place, especially Christian counselors, uh, but no, just counselors in general. Um, but it really is God that, that needs to provide the healing, and it's really his, his an encounter with his love. And part as we end today, that, that's the purpose of really an encounter with his love. But, uh, and there's lots of ministry to receive Father's love. Uh, I'll give you an example of a couple examples real quick. We've ministered in the Father's love now f since 2006, when we, so about 2007, actually, we started doing individual ministry sessions. 
had a woman, a uh, young lady that could not get pregnant. And uh, she came to us, and in essence, in those two sessions we had, she had been raped in college. Uh, even though she'd said no, she'd been drinking, and so she'd said no. Well, that rape led to a pregnancy where she had an abortion. So all through her life, she had the shame, the guilt. I mean, everything carried on that was her fault, even though it, it and literally wasn't. But she'd put herself in that position, I guess, drinking. But anyway, God came in through that session. And, and there's things we, I mean, in the ministry sessions where, I mean, we, we will stand in as the mother, we'll stand in as the father, we'll stand in for the, the perpetrator type thing and, and really speak into their spirits God's love and what he, what he wants them to hear. And every session is different. But after that session, it was within, I'm going to guess, six weeks. It was fairly quick she was pregnant, and she had spent several years. The doctors didn't know why. But, but that's the, the, the value of, I mean, the shame, everything, and Sheila will go into that, that it, there's, I mean, it changes our DNA. A lot of these wounds do. And uh, so anyway, Father's Love changed that. We had a woman that was in a, a gay lifestyle, lesbian, desperately wanted out of it, came for one session, and she was stra had been straight ever since. And she was a worship leader. And uh, so it was, it was pretty awesome. There's, there's, we've got a lot of testimonies. It's been pretty cool. But, uh, but really, if, if, I mean, you know, God chooses how he wants to heal people. But the goal is, if we can, if we can receive God's love, if, if you look at this chart, you've just broken every link there is. You don't have to go through all these other processes. It's just sometimes they're so intertwined, you need to do deliverance, you might do to receive forgiveness, so it's, but the goal really is just receive his love, and you've broken every link there is. Okay, moving on. So what's the steps for healing wounds? First of all, you have to make a choice. I mean, you've got to be in a, a position, say, I want some healing. I want more in my life. I want more of what God's for me. So it's, it, it's just, it's that. It's, and, it, and it's a process. I mean, you make that choice, but but typically, you're not going to be healed of every wound we've ever received all at one time. I'm still receiving healing. The last time or two times ago when we did this seminar, I don't, I don't even remember what I said. I was up on the stage, and I, I made a statement. And, I mean, there was more visions that came to me of, of some of the sin that I had been doing and, and calling this other kid a name. And, I mean, it just, and what I saw was Jesus with his disappointment looking at me. And I couldn't go on. So, so you're, you know, you're going to receive healing in the most inopportune times sometimes, but it's great. Uh, so make a choice. Then just receive appropriate ministry. I mean, like, you know, Jack Frost model. These are really the deliverance, bringing in the light, repentance, forgiveness, the cross, receive God's revelation. You're positioning yourself as best you can to receive the healing. Um, you need to be around people that are speaking blessings to you, blessing after blessing. Okay, the next one, the, uh, the last step to healing is you see yourself as God sees you. Uh, this is easy to say, and you're going to hear more about this, but in Mark 111, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. I mean, there's, there's and I'm not going to go through these, but there's scripture after scripture after scripture of what he says about you. Find those and read those to yourself over and over and over. Um, so I'm going to go on with that. Okay, the last slide, Bill, is the, I'm going to put the diagram up there again, but just as a, it's very intertwined, healing will always go on and on and on, but, but see that, you know, the basic thing is from the wound, it affects our life forever. And we just need to position ourselves to, to where can we break a link? Where can we break a link? Where can we break a link? You know, and, and I don't want to step on Sheila's toes. I've said this, but, you know, for me, with all the things that happened in my life, if it wasn't for forgiveness, I wouldn't be hearing from God. And I wouldn't be up here today either. I mean, this is a, a miracle in process for me to be up here. When you, when you hear my testimony that I was not allowed to speak, and nothing I say ever had any value, you know, I don't worry about that anymore. 
I might not be the dynamic speaker that somebody else is out there, but I'm doing what God's called me to do, and it's his job to translate what I say and what you hear it's between me and you. So uh, I just know God loves me now. I just do whatever. <laughs> and that's it. Hallelujah. Good morning. Um, I just uh, am so pleased that you've come out today because I really believe the Holy Spirit wants to take us from surviving to thriving. Amen. Because a lot of the time with all of these things, and I just I feel it's so powerful uh, what Tom was sharing this morning, we, we, we create these coping mechanisms, don't we, that uh, you, can, you can survive. But God doesn't want you just to survive. He wants you to really be ministers of God. We're all called to be releasing the glory and releasing the love of God. Uh, we're going to continue. We have another session now. That, and uh, then we're going to have a break for lunch. And, um, and we'll, there's some you know, places close by. You can go to the barracks or Miss India. I think I'll take these guys down to Miss India if you want to go there. It's, it's quick and easy. Just a, a one-hour lunch break we'll have then. And but we've got the tea and coffee set up that you just uh, through the sessions, it's probably going to be easiest if we do it this way because we want to just maximize our time. There's so much great uh, revelation and ministry time too that's going to be happening through the day. So if you want to help yourself to tea and coffee, uh, it's just over there. And um, you can, you're welcome to bring it in, uh, in here. But if you could just make sure you put it away uh, so that we, we don't ha leave any mess from you, Hope, in their morning service in the morning. Just for, let's just take one second or just a couple of seconds and, and just lift your hands up right now. Father God, we're just so grateful for the glory and your love that you're pouring into our hearts. Father, we thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. We thank you for ears to hear your truth and to receive. Lord, I pray that you'd enlighten our eyes to see your shining face smiling at us. Lord, thank you for the truth that you've revealed. Thank you for the love that you're sending. Thank you for the work that you've done in Tom's life and that the work, Lord, you're going to do in each and every life here today and through each and every life here today. Lord, we thank you that you multiply each of these seeds. We receive it with thanksgiving and ask that it would grow and produce much fruit in Jesus' name. Lord, we speak your refreshing and your blessing over each one. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, come on. Okay, why don't you give a big hand as uh, Sheila Williams comes. Thank you, guys. I actually think that you need to give yourselves a big hand for coming out on Saturday morning and giving up your Saturday. So I'm excited to see so many of you here because I know that means that you're looking for more. You're here because you want breakthrough. You know, many of us, as Catherine just said, you're just tired of going through the motions. Sometimes you may have even had the thought of, is this all there is to life? You know, there's got to be more. And you're right, there is. That's the good news. Tom has done an awesome job of laying the foundation for everything that we're going to talk about today. And now I get to bring the fun part and share with you more about God's grace. Do you know in the Bible, in John 10.10, Jesus tells us that he came to give us life, more abundant life. He came to give us abundance, abundance of grace, peace, love, life, and salvation. That's good news, isn't it? And Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has gone, and the new has come. So if we know Christ, we're a new creation, right? He came to give us life and give it more abundantly. Yeah, that's exciting. <laughs> but, but, but the reason you're going, hmm, is because we struggle with that, don't we? We struggle with the day-to-day -day things, you know, life just gets in the way sometimes. But if we look at that entire verse of John 10.10, 10, we can begin to understand why sometimes we struggle 
But God gives us the grace that we can overcome that. And so we're going to talk about it. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came to give us life and give it abundantly. So who, who is the thief in that verse? What do you think? The enemy, Satan. Yes, it's him and all his little cohorts he has out there. He wants to keep you stuck in that place of believing the lies that Tom just talked about, the things that have come into your life as a result of what's happened to you as you've gone along the way. And if he can keep us stuck in that old nature, then we, ha we don't have victory. We're not living the abundant life. But Christ says that we're a new creation, and that's what we have to begin to get into our spirits. And as Tom said, we want to dispel the lies. But have you ever really thought about what does it mean to be a new creation? Have you, have you really thought what does that mean? Well, we're going to take a look at what God says about that. Because you know, if you've read the book, he says some really good things about you. And he tells us how much he loves us. And you're going to see that you have nothing to fear because of his great love for us. We have nothing to fear in this life as we go along. Because anything that Satan brings against you, we have a bigger God, a bigger spirit that's going to take care of it. All we have to do is know how to access it. So what did God do? How much does he love us? Well, first of all, he sent his son to die in your place. That's a big thing right there, isn't it? Because I have two adult sons, and I know that as much as I love God's children, and you know, I know some of you personally, I love you, but I'm not sure. In fact, no, I'm, I'm pretty definite. I would not give up my one, one of my children for you because I love them too much. But God loved each and every one of us enough that he sent his son, and he allowed him to take our place. So that one thing in and of itself is pretty big. But he didn't stop there. Not only did he give his son for you, he took away all your sin. As far as the east is from the west. Do you know how far that is? Yes, yeah, somebody does. They never meet, do they? That's really good news. He's taken away things that you haven't even thought about doing yet. He's already paid the price for it. He came to bring you grace. He's given you his son. He's erased your sins. All he sees when he looks at you is righteousness. That's what we have to remember. He doesn't see anything in our past. He sees his son when he looks at you. But if he came to bring us grace... What is grace? We use that word a lot, but what does it really mean? Well, in Ephesians 2.8, it tells us that for by grace you were saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift from God. So grace is God's gift. That's what he brought. His grace saves us, and it changes us when we have the faith to believe that it can. It's grace that makes us the new creation that we're talking about. It's grace that makes us whole. So grace not only helps us to move forward and away from our past, it actually has already erased it. He sees how precious you are. He sees the son or daughter that he created when he looks at you. John 1.17 tells us, that for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth come by Jesus Christ. You know, when you think about the law, it was written on stone tablets, so it was literally cold and hard. It was impersonal, not to mention impossible to meet. You couldn't fulfill it on your own. So it came to point our need to a Savior. And Jesus is grace. You know, the Bible says, I am the truth and I am the life. And John 1, 17, we just read, says that grace and truth come by or through Jesus Christ. So doesn't that make sense that he is also grace? He's grace and truth. And grace is the opposite of the law. It's not cold and personal. It's warm and gentle 
and very personal. We can have a relationship with grace. Because, you know, God doesn't want blind obedience from us, does he? You know, that's why he gave us free will. He wants us to come with a desire for a relationship with him because that's what he wants. That's what he desires from each of us in this room more than anything else is that we come to him and we love him and our obedience comes out of that love. So when Jesus came, he came to totally abolish the law. He came to fulfill it, and his death did just that. It fulfilled every requirement of the law perfectly on your behalf. In Hebrews 10, 12 and 14, it says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So you see, if you look at that verse, it says that he's already perfected us forever. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? You've already been perfected. But notice that it also says that we are being sanctified. It doesn't always happen overnight. Sometimes it can. Jack Frost is one who his part of his transformation came overnight because he was immediately delivered from um, drugs and pornography. But as Tom shared his story, Jack has a very similar story. He became a Christian and he started working in the church, and, but it was all on performance and he burned out and, you know, it, because that part hadn't been healed. He still believed a lot of those lies. So, you know, a lot of people will tell you that as you get saved and you're a new creation, you don't need inner healing because God's already done it all. And that's true. You are a new creation. But because we have that enemy who's still out there every day trying to, you know, get in your head and make you believe the lies, that's why we struggle. And that's why we need to get to the root, cut it off at the root, you know, because, you know, if you dig something up by the roots you pull up a weed and you don't get the roots the weed comes back but you get it all and it doesn't come back and that's what God wants for you he wants to get to the root he wants to find where it started cut it off and you're done you're walking into that new creation that he's already given you because as we said the enemy is just kind of always around the corner <laughs> just waiting to see when he can get you he wants to deceive you. He wants to make you think that you're not worthy of God's gift of grace. If we believe those lies, it's going to keep us from becoming who we are in Christ. Because as Catherine said, we are all to be leaders and ministers of the gospel. But if we don't think we're worthy, you're not going to talk to the person next to you. Because why are they going to listen to me? But if you know that you're a child of the king... You carry authority and power and love everywhere you go, then you're going to start making a difference. You're all going to be change agents in this world, and that's what we were all created to be. We're not to settle for that smaller part of our life, you know, just living the story of getting by. We have a bigger story, a bigger plan that God has for everyone in this room, and that's where we want to go. You know, there's some people who have gone into ministry because they want to help others learn to live right. They feel like it's their job to bring conviction. They want you to straighten up and live right, brother. Well, conviction is a job of the Holy Spirit. That's who can bring true conviction. When we as man try to do that, a lot of us what we bring is condemnation. And we know that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So what we want to do is bring people to Christ by sharing his love and this story of grace and forgiveness and not, you know, the, the hellfire damnation. That's what I grew up under because I'm Baptist, so I've heard a lot of those sermons. And it does work. It, can, it causes a lot of people to go ahead and, and, and receive. But love works so much easier because if somebody comes to God out of fear they just don't want to go to hell and that sermon has scared them 
then they live their whole life unless someone else comes along and teaches them different that God's just waiting, you know, if he fails and messes up, what's going to happen? But if we come and we teach them about God's love and his grace, then they know that if they mess up, it's okay because he's a God of grace and mercy and forgiveness because we all mess up. You know, every day we all do some, some little something that we probably shouldn't have done or a thought. You know, we're, none of us are perfect. We're all a work in progress. That's why we need a God who's full of grace. Because once a person understands how much they're loved, j- you know, just think about a young couple dating, and you're just so, you know, gloriously in love and everything's great and you know you want to do everything you can to please that person don't you and it's because you love them it's because you care about them and that's the way God is he wants us to come to him because we love him because we know he loves us you know he first loved us that's where it all began so we just have to grab hold of that and know But that's how we're going to win people to Christ. You know, some people are afraid to teach grace because they think it gives people a license to sin. But it's really just the opposite. Because if you know God's love, you're going to hesitate to do that thing because you don't want to hurt him. You don't want to disappoint him. Just like you wouldn't want to hurt or disappoint someone you're in a relationship with that you care about. You know, um, a long time ago, when I first started learning more about this wonderful God of love, and I was listening and trying to hear, and I kept thinking that I was going to hear this big, booming voice from heaven, and, you know, I never heard that. And then finally, I heard a teaching by Mark Verkler, and he talked about how God speaks to us in that still, small voice. You know, it's that thought that pops into your head that you probably would have never had on your own. But the thoughts that God brings you are always positive. The Holy Spirit is positive. So every good thought comes from him. Every negative thought that you're thinking is coming from the enemy. So any time you start to think, oh, I can't do that. I'm not worthy. Oh, what will they think? They might reject me if they really knew That's all from the enemy, and you want to stand up against that and say, no, my God loves me. I have a daddy in heaven who thinks I'm precious, and I'm not listening to your lies anymore. It's like Tom said, those lies, especially, you know, depending on how old you are, the longer you've believed it, you know, it could take some while to really let that truth sink into you. So you just keep repeating those words that God has given you. The things that are in his scripture about how awesome you are. And you can dispel those lies. But, you know, if Satan's always making us think these things, what do we do about it? Well, Paul tells us the importance of our thoughts in 2 Corinthians 10.5 when he tells us that the weapons that we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have the power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of Christ, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So if Christ doesn't think you're unworthy, we need to take that thought and make it obedient to what he does say. And then finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's where we're to be going with our thoughts. We're to focus on the good things, not only in ourselves, but in others. So we have to be very careful what we speak. Because our words carry power. If you think about it, we were created in God's image. God created things just by speaking it out. 
And so we need to be life speakers. We need to be speaking life to people, to encouraging people and ourselves. You know, what's that self-talk that you hear? You feel like you have this little voice that sits on your shoulder and tells you things? Oh, shut up, stupid. I can't believe you just said that. You know, do you, do you hear those things? When you hear those, start and stop and say, no, that's not true. I'm not stupid. I'm brilliant. I'm amazing because I'm a child of the king. We want to speak lives to ourselves, to our spirit. You know, grace is such a great gift that we could just keep talking about it for weeks. You could do a whole sermon series on nothing but grace. So I encourage you in your time alone with God to do a study. You know, take out your concordance and find all the scriptures with grace in it because you'll really enjoy it and just begin to get those truths into your spirit. And Romans 5.17 says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. We are to be reigning in life through Jesus who lives in us. Not just going through the motions, but reigning. Are you ready to reign? You're free to become who God created you to be. You're already that new creation. Because when Jesus came to the cross, he came with an agenda. And his agenda was complete freedom for everyone who comes to him. That's what he wants to give everyone here. That's the reason he came. And Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. So you want to start telling the enemy to get under your feet. That's where he belongs. He has no other place but under your feet. You have authority to do that. You just tell him, hey, I'm a king, a daughter of the king. I'm a son of the king. And my daddy fights back. He takes care of me. So you are living the abundant life of grace, peace, and love. And if you're not, you can be. So how do you do that? That's why you're here, isn't it? You want to know. And I believe that as we begin to understand grace and love, as we begin to change the way we think about ourselves, our circumstances, and the people around us, so we come out of agreement with the lies that the enemy has brought into our, our hearts and our minds. If we can get rid of those things that we believe that are wrong, you're going to be set free. But it's a process, and it helps to learn as much as you can, like you're doing here today. And as Tom said, the greatest way is just that time with God, and that he's going to give you the revelation that you need to know who you are in him. And it looks different for everybody. But when it happens, you're going to know it. Because there's no way to describe the love that you feel when you just know who you are. You have to begin to walk it out. You know, it's one thing to believe it. But if you don't start walking it out and act like that person who has some authority, who matters, who has value, it takes a lot longer. So begin to walk it out. I know many of you have received prophetic words, and you think, oh, that's a good word, but with what's going on right now, I don't know how it's ever going to happen. You know, you let your circumstances dictate where you are. It's time to take those prophetic words out and start walking into it because that's why God gave it to you. He's giving you the hope already in that word, and you just need to start walking towards it and believing it regardless of your circumstances. Amen. <laughs> but, you know, we want to get free from all the things that bind us. And sometimes that can be a little bit painful because you may have to go into a memory that you've tried to stuff for a lot of years and you think, oh, I've dealt with that. I'm not bringing it up again. But if you still see the fruit there, you got to let it surface. you got to let the Holy Spirit do what needs to happen to get free. And sometimes, you know, God is kind about it, though. He's not ever going to leave you there. 
You know, many people we minister to think, oh, I don't want to go there because I'll just, I'll never stop crying. It's too hard. But God's not going to leave you there. He's going to take you to that place. He's going to bring healing, and you are going to walk out gloriously. I can promise you that. I've never seen anybody not do that. It's amazing, the transformations that happen. But sometimes he'll just bring a memory to you, or sometimes it's a dream. And what he's doing is giving you the chance and the opportunity to see, oh, if I'm dreaming about that person and that was not so good, then I probably might still need to forgive them. So he's just bringing things to your mind so that you can get rid of it. And one by one, you can begin to let go. You know, you may have a memory of a brother who was cruel to you or someone who hurt you in school or it could be a parent, someone who tried to ruin your reputation. Whatever it is, God is giving you that memory. Bring it, you know, maybe something you haven't even thought of in years and you think, why am I thinking of that? Well, ask God. God, do I still need to forgive that person? Is that why you're bringing this to me? And let him begin to work on your heart so that you can begin to reign. You don't want to carry any of that baggage with you. You want to go through life reigning and being who God has created you to be. So in helping you to learn to reign in life and live the abundant life that God has given you already, we're going to talk about forgiveness. Tom, Tom kept telling you I'm going to talk about forgiveness, so here it comes. <laughs> now, after years of ministering with people, we and others in, in um, healing ministry have really realized and found that one of the main reasons that people feel trapped and don't receive their healing, whether it be physical or emotional, most often has to do with unforgiveness, things that they're holding on to that become bitterness if you don't take care of them. So forgiveness is the key to blessing and reigning. Because forgiveness and repentance is what opens our hearts and allows God to begin to flow freely in us and through us to others. So to, right now, we just want to give the Holy Spirit permission to bring to our minds anything that needs to be resolved in our hearts. So as I'm talking, you may just feel you have something that it just drops into your spirit. You can make a note of it. We're going to pray at the end. But just keep those things in mind. So we just want to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because if you want to see a powerful release of the Holy Spirit in your life and in the people around you, you must first know that absolutely nothing is impossible to God. So some of the things that have happened to you I know are so big and so hurtful that you can't imagine really ever letting go of it, letting go of that person. But with God's help, you can do it. You know, because he is so big, we can't even fathom his might and his power and his love for us. You know, our, our minds are not, we just can't fathom it. His majesty and his greatness. So first, that's where we start. Nothing is imposs impossible with God's help. And then second, we need that revelation that we've been talking about of how awesome his love is and how much he wants to give it to you how much he cares for you and he is dedicated to loving each and every one of you in this room to life he wants to love you back to life the parts that you feel like you've just kind of let die the dreams you've let die he wants to bring it all back to life he loves you and he's going to meet you where you are today because he loves you too much to leave you where you are. He has a much better plan. So we need to grasp how we can walk in this love that we're talking about. And not only walk in it, but give it away to others. You want to be carriers of his presence. That people just see something different when you walk in a room. And the atmosphere changes. Because you carry his love. You carry his joy. And people begin to want what you have. You know, I've talked to many people along the way who um, 
You know, it's like, well, why do I want to become a Christian? Look how miserable they are. They can't, you know, they, they, we don't live what God is wanting us to live. We want to be excited about who he is and who we are so that other people will come. And that's what this church is awesome about doing. I know when you walk in here, you feel that love. So you are in a great place to be loved to life. But, you know, part of going through the motions, as we've talked about, it kind of wears you out, doesn't it? takes away a lot of energy but if we grasp how much God loves us we have more love more energy to share with others right now sometimes you feel like you can't even love the people around you the way they deserve to be loved because you're just tired this is too hard so when you get free of all this stuff it begins to bring more energy to your life you're not carrying around all the stress and things that weigh you down. You know, you, you talk about baggage as a visual thing, but really, if you think about it, 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 that's exactly what it is. And if you've ever traveled a lot, especially before they had roller things and you're carrying all this luggage, you're just totally worn out by the end of the day. Well, it's the same thing emotionally in our minds and in our hearts. If we're carrying around this baggage, it's very draining and it's very tiring. So we want to get free of that so we can deserve love the people around us the way they deserve to be loved so that we and they can reign in life so let's take a look at what God's word says about forgiveness and how it can make a difference in our lives Matthew 7 1 through 12 says do not judge or you will be judged for in the same way you judge others with the measure you use it will be measured to you. So what he's saying here is if you demand justice and repayment for the wrongs that have been done to you, then the way you treat people in demanding that is the same way that you're going to be treated. There's a book by Dr. James Richards called How to Stop the Pain. And one of the main things he talks about in that book is if we stop judging the people who've hurt us, we won't be living in as much pain. Because as you judge a person, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you have you know, had something happen to you and you keep going, why in the world did they do that? Gosh, it must have been because they thought this or that and the other. And you know, you just have all these thoughts going on over and over in your head and that's keeping the pain alive. Yeah, you because know, you're not letting go, you're trying to figure it out. And it's not a healthy thing to do because really 98% of the time if you could go to that person and ask them about what happened you would find that their motive is nowhere near what you are thinking we're thinking things because the enemy is trying to keep us in that place and keep us down believing lies about us many times people hurt us and they don't even realize they've hurt us and a lot of times that's because it's our own woundings, it's our own trigger. They may have said something that if they had said it to, you know, John Doe across the street, he wouldn't have thought anything about it. But they say it to you and you become offended. So many times it's what comes through our own filter. So we have to be very careful in not judging because not only is it going to be measured back to us, but it keeps the pain alive in your own heart. So if we stop judging others and we're able to forgive as we do that and allow Jesus to come in and heal that area so the pain can go we want him to heal our hearts but you have to decide which do you want do you want his peace or do you want to keep living with the bitterness no that's not a good place to be you know it's easy to see how people can get caught up as victims have you ever met somebody who kind of just has the victim mentality because things that have happened to people in life are very traumatic I mean I, I realized as I started ministering to people I had lived a very sheltered life myself and there are horrific things that happen out there and probably some of you in this room have had those kind of experiences and if you've been abused and had a lot of trauma in your life well it, it's hard so sometimes find God or to believe that he's there well you know especially this loving God that we've been talking about because you know Lord if you really love me like that why are these things happening 
Why did this happen to me as a child? You know, there are things that we don't understand and questions that we want to ask. And I'm here to tell you that God is big enough for you to ask those questions of him. He has the answers. We just have to ask him. There was a lady once, we were at a retreat and um, doing some prayer ministry. And she came towards the end of the night. She had kind of took her all night to work up courage. So we were all kind of really getting ready to go. And so rather than stay in the room because they needed to shut it down for the night, we took her back to our room. And we started praying with her. And after a while, we just weren't really getting anywhere. You know, it's like there were a lot of blockages there. And everybody was getting tired, including her. So we just said, well, let's just pray. We'll give you peace. You know, have a good night's rest. And we'll, we'll, we'll pray again tomorrow morning. But at that time, I, I love to hug people. You know, I just love to give big, big hugs. And so I was just hugging her as somebody else was praying over her. And the minute I hugged her, she just began to weep. And she was saying, no, no, no. And it's like, you know, because we had asked the hard question earlier in the, in the ministry session, you know, God, where were you when she was being beat? This, this poor lady had been beaten every day from the time she was 12 years old till she was 13. When she would come home from school, her mother would have her change clothes, put on little shorts and a tube top, and lay across the bed, and she would beat her. It's what happened every single day. And like Tom said, it was to the point of blood. And so at that age, and she was a tiny kind of frail little girl, you might not even survive that kind of beatings every single day. And you can imagine what it does to you emotionally, if not physically. But as she's yelling, no, 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 and, you know, we're going, okay, what's going on? What's God, you know, what's happening here? Because you, you don't hear people, like to hear people going, no, no, no. But she was just weeping, and she said, Jesus is showing me how he has just laid his arms out like this. And he was covering her back, protecting her. So as bad as the beatings were, she's like, if, if he hadn't been there, I might not be here today. And God wants to do that for everyone in this room. He can tell you. He can show you. Because he's never left you. He's never forsaken you. That's what his word tells us that. So don't be afraid to ask the big questions. Because as you find God, as you find his solace, his love, and his peace, it's going to be a beautiful journey of release and recovery. And it can begin right now, this weekend. You don't have to wait. It can start today. You know, in Genesis 6, 6, it tells us that the Lord was grieved that he had made man on earth, and his heart was filled with pain. You see, God feels pain because of human sin, because he knows how it hurts people. He loves us, and that causes him to hurt when we hurt. He knows how wonderful life on earth was supposed to be, how he intended it to be. So loss of all kinds that's painful to man is also painful to God. He doesn't ignore it. He grieves when you grieve. And he's sad when you're sad. He longs to comfort you and to hold you and to show you his great love. He wants to give you his peace more than anything. You know, but Satan is that thief that we talked about, and he tries to rob you of your joy. He wants to keep you feeling kind of squashed down in the middle of everything. But God wants you to have that joy. He wants to reconnect joy centers in our brains to heal us and to just give us back what the enemy has tried to rob because we're his covenant children. But unforgiveness is one of the main things that can hinder what God wants to do in your life. He wants to get rid of all the bitterness because Scripture tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every other form of malice. We're to get rid of that and instead be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God has forgiven you. You know, I've had some situations in my life where I've experienced great betrayal. 
two of the situations were close family members, and one was in a church setting. All of them were hurtful, some more devastating than others for the time. But I've been fortunate that God has always made it easy for me to forgive because I grew up in a very loving and forgiving family who you know, didn't hold grudges or think badly about people. So I've naturally found it easy to do. But one day, thinking I had forgiven all these things, I was talking to a friend, and I said, you know, I'm just beginning to resent what so-and-so is doing. And she looked at me and said, hmm, I think you might need to do some healing there. <laughs> and um, that dear friend was Donna Wilson here. And that's what friends are for, to help you see when you're speaking things and hold you accountable so that you can continue on your journey to healing. Because you know the root of resentment is unforgiveness. So even though I had forgiven her on, on a level, there was still more. And I needed to not only forgive her, but let go of my expectations of her. And once I did that, and allowed God to come in and heal those hurts, and, and then God also, sometimes he does things like, um, as I'm praying and doing all this, it's like, well, you've prayed forgiveness, you've released her, you've done all the things, but you prayed to bless her? <laughs> really, God? <laughs> you want me to bless her after what she's done? Okay, what does that sound like? Still a little stuff there, huh? So, okay. God, please bless her. Not sure I really mean it, but I want you to bless her. Well, finally, I got to the point where I could bless her and allow God to release me, release her. She's free. You know, unforgiveness kind of keeps you tied to another person. In the spirit realm, there's a connection. You, know, you talk about breaking the chains that bind you. Well, sometimes the chains are to another person. And as we release that person, not only do we become free, but so do they. And often in ministry situations, we've prayed for someone as they've forgiven a loved one. And then later they come back and tell us, you're not going to believe what's happened to so-and-so since I forgave them. They never told that person they were forgiven, but they did it in their hearts, and it was between them and God. And that released that person for God to work in them too. So unforgiveness is very powerful, or forgiveness is very powerful. So it was unforgiveness, but in a negative way. So we want to get rid of all that bitterness. We want to give it back to God. And now when I think of the situation that happened in my life and this person, I, I don't have any emotion. You know, it, it doesn't bring up any, stir up anything. And, and that's a good place to be. That's where you want to be. That's where God wants all of you to be. Tom, can you come up and share a little bit of your testimony with your brother? Well, I told you a little bit of the wounds that I received, and you think I probably need to forgive a few people? Um, my brother that did a lot of stuff to me, uh, just a few years ago as we started going through healing rooms and Elijah House and a lot of things, I learned that I have to forgive. And uh, that wasn't something that I could really do, but I was told I had to. So I took a piece of paper. This is for my brother. I took a piece of paper, and I would read, I forgive you. I don't mean it, God, but I forgive you, and I, I just read it. And, and that's where I started in my process. And I, and I would literally say, God, I don't really mean this, but I'm reading it out loud. So that was the first level of forgiveness that I did for my brother. But the more I read that, God would put things in my heart that, you know, you need to get past this. And, and so the more I read it, the more I started believing it. And I got to a point that I really felt that I had forgiven my brother. Um, and, and I, what I received was I would receive blessings and I'd receive peace. And when I would go and I would be around him, I wouldn't be, I mean, I could be around him at least because before that I couldn't. Now back up a little bit that I, I told you my testimony that I had been sick pretty much my whole life. I mean, as a child, it carried through. I had like bronchial, uh, you know, type things. I'd go to the doctor every two or three months, and I was on all kinds of medicines and allergies is what the doctor said. And so I was sick throughout my life. 
with bronchial problems. And so anyway, I really felt I had forgiven my brother. Uh, December of 2008, this is a couple years into, we, we had gone to Jack Frost School in 2006, and that's when I really started dealing with the sexual abuse. And, and really, probably shortly thereafter, I started trying to forgive and then eventually feeling like I had. So anyway, December 2008, I went back to the farm and I was visiting, and it's like God took me to all the spots. I, you know, I went to the well and I wept. And I went to the barn, which is where a lot of the, the things happened. And, I, and I, I just laid down and I wept. And I went behind, out to the woods. And so basically, God was taking me to the places where, things, where I had been abused. And I wept and wept. And what came over me was a, a total new compassion for my brother. A and, and God downloaded, it was a question. I went and asked my brother. Uh, I said, you know, did... did um, how did Grandpa treat you? Now, Grandpa had not treated me badly. As far as I know, nobody else. I had no reason to ask him that question. But when I started, you know, in, in the forgiveness process, God gave me this question. And what I found out from my brother was horrendous stories of how Grandpa had treated him and the things he had done to him. And, and it was just immediate. The compassion for my brother was I was no longer the victim. I had more compassion for him. So that was a, in my mind, a third level of forgiveness. The first was, I'm just doing it out of duty, I have to. And the second was, I really felt I had forgiven. But, but what this tells me is, you know, we might feel we have forgiven, but we still need to pursue with God, is there a different level? So then I came home and I told Donna, and it was nothing. You know, it was just like, hey, this was an experience, but I didn't notice any difference. Fast forward two years later, December of 2010, so very recently, I'm laying in bed one morning, and God, this is the only time that I can remember hearing the audible voice of God, but I heard a voice and said, Tom, how long has it been since you've been sick? And it's like, hmm, I mean, it, this is a shock when you hear a voice for the first time, you know, because before it was sensing, and, and anyway, so I asked Donna, and we said, you know, I mean, it's been a couple years. Now, I know that sounds silly. You're sick all the time, and then you're not sick. But I went out to the medicine cabinet. It was December of 2008 was the last time that I had had medicine for the bronchial problem. So two years to the day, and, and I went back to bed, and, and God said, he, he just said this, made a statement, and when did you truly forgive your brother? I mean, pretty much the month that I forgave him, I was no longer sick. I, I mean, it's it just, it was a, uh, so that, so that's the, the power that Satan has over you for unforgiveness it, is, I mean, it just it holds in your body. And, and I, wa I want to give one quick more one that, uh, if I can remember it. <laughs> Actually, I do. Because uh, this is, you know, but, but, you know, I mean, that was forgiving my brother, but for my father also, this was... Because forgiveness for me started the whole realm of God's revelation. On, on all these wounds that I'd received, that's when I started receiving revelation of, of, the, of the lies that I believed. During my really small childhood, I, was, I would ride a tractor on the running board standing up, and in the heat of the day, I would sleep. And, and, I, you know, I, and I, I really, my whole life wondered, how did I ever stay awake? How did I not fall off and get run over by the big tractor wheels? Why did Dad not protect me? I mean, it was just, I mean, it's just a question, but it was always there. And it was sh after I forgave my father that I received the revelation, and 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 he showed me that Jesus was there holding on to me as I was standing. And and so, I mean, the, the forgiveness has been awesome. Thank you, Tom. God is good, isn't he? He wants to heal every heart in here just like that. You know, we need to take his word on forgiveness seriously. Because as we said in the beginning, if you want to be in obedience with God's word, and as you are in obedience with God's word, you're going to receive a greater anointing. So if you want to move forward with God, you need to be forgiving. You need to be searching those places in your heart. But I want to talk now about what forgiveness is not. Because there are a lot of misconceptions, and it's a lot of things that keep people from...
from being able to forgive. Forgiveness is not forgetting that the wrong ever happened. You're still going to have a memory of the event, but the key is it no longer has power over you. You're no longer held captive because of it. Forgiveness does not always include reconciliation because sometimes you've been hurt and abused by someone that you don't want a relationship with. You don't have to. The forgiveness happens in your heart between you and God because there are many times, you know, we would tell people, you know, I'm not sure you want to go and let that person know that you've forgiven them because they're not a safe person. And many times you can become, you know, wounded again. So the forgiveness takes place between you and God. And God is a God of reconciliation and restoration, and he wants to restore relationships. But there are people out there who aren't safe, and you have to be aware of that. And so we just ask people to pray and ask God, are you to go and try to reconcile that relationship? Is that what you want in your heart? And oftentimes it is. But it's not something that has to happen for forgiveness. Sometimes the person you need to forgive has already gone to be with the Lord. So reconciliation can't happen here on earth. But it happens in your heart. And when you release that, you'll see a huge difference. Forgiveness doesn't mean that they're off the hook. It means they're off your hook and onto God's. Because vengeance is for God. It's not for us. We have a God of grace and mercy, so sometimes vengeance may not look like what we want it to look like. But we have to leave it with God, release it, put it in his hands for him to deal with. So total forgiveness, as I mentioned earlier in my testimony, is when we can ask God to forgive the person and also to bless them. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Often you don't feel like forgiving the person, like Tom just shared with his brother. He, he didn't want to forgive him, but he knew he needed to. He knew he, needed, he had to to move on with God. So sometimes you just have to even ask God, the Lord, to help change my attitude towards this person. You know, I can't even begin to forgive them yet. And like we said earlier, God meets you where you are. He knows you're struggling, and he's going to help you do that. The good news is that he's already forgiven them. So you can reach up and say, okay, Lord, I'm having trouble here, but you've already forgiven him. So give me your forgiveness to extend to them. He wants to give you that. One important thing to understand is that unforgiveness gives Satan a legal right to continue to wreak havoc in your life. He's a legalist, and if you open a door, he's going to step in, and he's going to take every bit of ground that he can. So we want to release that. Hebrews 12, 15 says, See to it that no one misses the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Because, you know, as we talked about, the baggage that we carry keeps us from loving the people around us the way they deserve to be loved. You know, forgiveness is part of that baggage. And if we're carrying that around and it becomes a bitter root, it's not only hurting us, it's hurting the people around us, too, in ways that you don't even realize. You know, the things we do and the way we handle things affects our children. It affects the people around us. But unforgiveness hinders what the Lord is wanting to do in you. And I know you're all here because you want to move forward. You want things to be different. You want more. And so if you, if you have any unforgiveness, again, you know, just let the Holy Spirit begin to bring those things to you right now. Unforgiveness makes the person that we're not forgiving an idol to us. Wow. Wow. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? But do you realize why? If we're holding on to that person and we stay focused on that, and a lot of times you may not even be focused, but you're giving them a lot more energy than you realize. And it's taken that focus away from God where it should be. 
So think about that. But the good news is our daddy God is good. We've been telling you all morning, and it's really true. He came to give us a way out of our mess. You know, we, we get ourselves in these places sometimes, but he always is there ready to give us a hand up and get us out of the muck and mire that we sometimes create. Sometimes it's, you know, other people. But he has come to set us free, to heal the brokenhearted, and to open the prison doors. That's one of my favorite verses. He has come to do that, not only for me, not only for Tom, but for every one of you. So we are to lose others through forgiveness. Because Matthew 16, 19, this is part of why I was talking about earlier that people will change after you've forgiven them. It says, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So as you are loosing others, freeing others through forgiveness, you're now allowing God to loose things to them, to bring healing to them as well. But I know that many of you have been wounded and you've been betrayed and abused by people that you really should have been able to trust. Some of your parents, relatives, people who you really cared about, people who should have been protecting you. And that's really hard to deal with. It's hard to understand. But know that God's not forgotten you. Just like the lady at the retreat, he's not forgotten you. You may have made vows sometimes as a result of those wounds. I'm never going to let anyone hurt me like that again. I'm not going to let anyone have that kind of power over me. I'll never be like my mother. Well, guess what? How many of us made that statement? <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't want to do those things. I don't want to be like that. I'll never do this. I'll always take care of myself. I don't need anybody else. You know, there's spiritual laws in the Bible. One of them is sowing and reaping. And when we make vows and judgments, because if you're making a vow like that, you know, I'll never, just be careful when you hear yourself saying, I'll never or always. Those are very often a sign that you're making a vow at the moment that you say that. And, and you think it's a good thing because you don't want to be like the person who's you know, had a bad influence on you and others. But in reality... You're judging that person in making the vow. And we talked about judgments earlier. So if we are judging others, and if we are, you know, we know that we're entitled to justice because of the things that have happened to you. But if you're looking for that justice, then you're going to reap what you're sowing. You too are going to receive the justice you deserve instead of mercy. So when you begin to understand that, you know what Jesus meant when he said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So as you extend mercy to the people who've hurt you, you receive mercy as well. You reap what you sow. You know, God gave us a great treasure when he gave us Jesus because all of our debts have already been paid. All of our sins are forgiven. And we've been given a glorious inheritance that we're to share with others. We're to give people gifts that they don't deserve. Because the people who've hurt you and wounded you, you know, do they deserve your forgiveness? In your heart, you'd probably say no. And, and I understand that. When you've been hurt and violated by people, it's hard to give them and release that because they owe an outstanding debt to you. But we can give them a gift that they don't deserve, and that's your forgiveness. Just as Jesus forgave us even when we didn't deserve it. And as I mentioned earlier, because of grace, we can grab hold of his forgiveness for that person. And we can say, Lord, help me. I know you've already forgiven him. Help me. Ask him to give you his forgiveness for them. But very often, as we've mentioned, the tragedies are just so serious and so severe that you can't imagine letting go of them. 
I know that's very real. And you, you expect me to let go of it with just one little prayer? Is that really going to happen? Well, good news is, yes, it can really happen that way. But sometimes the wounds are just too fresh even. You know, maybe something that's happened recent and, and you, you just haven't come to terms with it. You're not ready to let go and you need more time. And God, God knows that. And he wants to help you. And he wants to begin to heal your heart so that you can get to that place. Are there a few people that you might need to forgive? Has God brought people to your mind today as we've been talking? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in a little while, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and we're going to walk through forgiveness together. But I'm going to ask you not to strive as we do that. You may be saying, well, I'm going to say it with the words, but I'm not sure I'm going to really mean it. And that's okay, because again, God knows where you are. He knows what you've been through, and he is going to help you. So you just ask him, Lord, help me to work through this. This is too big for me to do on my own. I need your help. And he's going to be faithful to meet you. Lord, make me willing to be willing. I know I need to, but it's hard. He honors that. We're also going to ask God to forgive us for the sins of judging others. And we're going to ask him to graciously remind us in the future when we begin to lapse into negative thinking again and judging others. Because what we want to do is bless and not curse. We want to give undeserved people, gifts to people. We want to be vessels of honor and mercy because that's who God created us to be. So I'm just asking you right now to just allow the Holy Spirit to come and enable you to walk into freedom and love so you can reign in life because that's what his desire is for you. He has so much more. So let's just take a moment to wait on God before we start the prayer. I want you to just be bathed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we just invite you right now to come afresh. We don't want to be striving to do this in religious strength or out of our own willpower. We know that without your enabling, we might not be able to proceed because some of the crimes against us have just been too extreme. Some of us have been so abused and the circumstances that they've been through and things that have happened were never, never your heart, Father. And we know that. But they were born from sin that's been loosed in the world. As well as other people's sins and the way they've hurt us. And sometimes it's even our own wrong choices. Lord, we know that you're not responsible for the sins of man. But you're here to forgive. And you want us to forgive. And we thank you that we can defeat the devil we can make sure that the sins of the fathers are not passed on to the children to the third and fourth generations. Because we know if we don't deal with these things, our legalistic just judgments, and if we don't step into your grace and mercy, then Satan, who is the master legalist, is going to see to it that these things continue. And we want him to stop right now. So just come, Holy Spirit. Fall fresh in this place. And begin to soften the hearts of your children. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for loving us. Just come, Holy Spirit. As I pray this prayer, there are going to be places where I stop. And you'll figure out there are places where you're going to release the person who's hurt you. You may have more than one, so just insert. I'm going to you know, stop. And then there's a place to, for what you're forgiving them for. So again, in your mind, you're just going to be saying these things and releasing them to God. So 
sometimes there are things that we've tried to make up for, you know, things that have happened, and we want to just give that to God, too. We don't have to make up for the things that have happened to us. So we're going to begin. So just close your eyes and say it along with me in your, in your head, or you can say it out loud if you choose. But Lord, you t- have told me that forgiveness is not an option. You simply said that I have to choose, and I'm finding it hard to even do that. Please do for me what I can't do for myself. By myself, I can't forgive. But for your sake, Jesus, and as an act of my will, I give you the right that I felt was mine to throw people, even myself, into a debtor's prison. So, Lord, I release... I forgive them for Jesus before you and the people in this room is my witness they owe me nothing I give you the right to hold them accountable for their actions. Lord, dismantle the prison that I've built for others. And I thank you, Jesus, for accomplishing forgiveness for me. Lord, take the keys to the prison of unforgiveness that I've built for myself. Release me from trying to make up for. Release me from the prison of trying to be worthy. You alone are my worth. I give you my feelings of unworthiness. Lord, help me to forgive myself for what I did or didn't do. Help me to forgive myself. Release me to receive the forgiveness that you want to give me. I give you the right to hold me accountable for my actions or lack thereof sometimes. You know what to require of me and of others and when to give mercy. And I thank you for that. I thank you for loving me. I release you, God, from the expectations that I've had of you. Your ways are not my ways. I can never wrap my mind around forgiveness. I don't understand it. I don't know how it works. But when you did not do what I expected or wanted of you, I became angry and resented you. I didn't understand. And I thank you that I don't have to pretend that it's all right or pretend that it doesn't hurt or that it doesn't matter. Thank you for listening to my expressions of pain. I forgive you, Lord, for what I perceive to be sins of omission on your part. Forgive me, Lord, for my anger and resentment and help me to accept you and your ways. Begin to teach me your ways, Lord. I know that my hurt matters to you. I know that I'm valued. And I just thank you and praise you for that, Lord. My hurt and my sin matters to you. And it matters so much that you provided forgiveness for my healing. I've not looked at it that way in the past, but now I understand that forgiveness is my pathway to healing. Lord, wash my mind, my spirit, and emotions of the acid of pain, resentment, and anger, and begin to clothe me now 
with your righteousness. I wear your robe of righteousness. I thank you that's what, what you see when you look at me. I know that my emotions are going to heal in time. And in time, I'm going to be able to forgive emotionally as well on an even different level than I have right now. I will be able to feel the emotion of being forgiven and of extending forgiveness. But until then, Lord, I just ask that you keep mending my wounded spirit and my bruised emotions. Thank you for taking care of the legal aspects of forgiveness for me, for restoring relationships with others when they need to be, but especially for restoring relationships with you and the Father. I love you, and I thank you for loving me. I thank you for beginning to release me of the bitterness and the pain that I've allowed to control my life, that I've responded sometimes in sinful ways because of that pain. So I thank you for releasing me. I thank you for healing me and loving me. You are awesome, God. We love you, Daddy. And we just ask today for a greater revelation of your love. Just let people feel your presence right now, Lord, in a way that they've never felt it before. As they've released, they've been obedient to your word. They're seeking you. They want healing. And we just thank you, Jesus. You are holy, you are mighty, and you are worthy. And you created us worthy of every good gift. You are our daddy, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So how's that feel? Feel pretty good? Feel a little lighter? You left some baggage at the cross? That's a good place to leave it. Well, it is 1230, so it's time for lunch, and we don't want to keep you because we haven't given you a real long time for lunch, so we want you to be able to, to go and get back at 1.30 because the best is yet to come. God has even greater things for you. So thanks for paying such good attention today, and we love you all and see you in a little bit. with a few little things added, <laughs> but it's good.